Welcome to episode 17 of Human Factors Cast. We're talking about video game design. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Billy Hall. Hey, everybody. How's it going today? And Blake Arnstorff. What's going on, everybody? Oh, man. You guys, I think we're finally live streaming. Is it real? I think it's real. Oh, Is this just man. a fantasy? <laughs> I think we're finally going. So uh, if you're just joining us, we are live streaming on YouTube. Finally, uh, we have overcome all of our usability issues and technical problems uh, we are up. We are live streaming. We are good to go. Isn't it so funny that a technical bo- uh, podcast is uh, having technical difficulties? It's absolute irony. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Guys, how are we doing this week? I'm doing great. I mean, it's Halloween. It is Halloween. So we are recording on Halloween. Um, but we recorded we're psych- nerds. what Psychology of Fear uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the episode that's dropping today. Yeah, or no, that dropped last Thursday. But well, last Thursday, I mean. So we record these a little bit in advance. Um, but if you want to send us questions about our upcoming shows, uh-huh. and it doesn't even have to be questions; it could be comments, short stories. Uh, we actually heard one today that we'll hear from. Uh, we love hearing from you guys. Um, and uh, just to go over some of the upcoming shows next week, we'll talk about usability testing methodology. That's methods, metrics, and much, much more. Um, uh, psychology of Thanksgiving's coming up. Psychology of th- or human factors of theme parks, which will be a fun one. Psychology Wee. of color. We got a bunch of cool topics. If you want to suggest a topic, go ahead and send it to us. Uh, but Billy, yes. what are we talking about today? Today we're going to be talking about the video games design. Uh oh, video games. Design. Yes. Oh it, man, I'm really excited about that. Honestly, I mean, like I always uh, see all these YouTube videos and extra credit about video game design, but. I've never really looked at what the technical aspects of it are. Man, video game design is cool. Yeah. Uh, before uh, we, we before we continue on with the topic, I want to read a message from Luke C. from Australia. Thanks, Luke. All the way from Australia. Yeah. Luke writes, hey, guys, recently found your podcast. It's been very interesting. I'm an aspiring human factor psychology researcher. So to find a podcast like this was really cool. I thought it would be interesting and maybe a bit nerdy if you reviewed what human factor designs and strategies are implemented into a huge uh, into hugely successful video games like world of warcraft keep up the podcasts man well thanks for writing in luke and first off there is no nerdy uh we uh, well i mean i guess there is nerdy but yeah, i mean there's nerdy. no judgment for being nerdy no definitely <laughs> not definitely not I mean, because I mean, look at us. We have right? all glasses on. <laughs> Got David Pumpkins over here. <laughs> David Pumpkins. <laughs> Niche. I mean, I had to. I had yeah, to. Yeah, it looks great. Thanks. Um, so yeah, video games. Yeah. Thanks, Luke, for writing in. Yeah, thanks, Luke. That's an awesome <laughs> topic. Um, if you want to hear your topic on the show, write in like Luke did. You might hear it. Um, so video games, that's close to all of our hearts, I yes, think. I, I think, think so, too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, guys, I couldn't even believe some of the stats that come out from like some of the video game associations nowadays. Like yeah. More than 150 million people in the U.S. alone play I, video games. I saw these stats. million what? people? I couldn't believe these. It's nuts. So, like... Uh, I mean, like, that's the thing. I've been playing video games since I was a little kid. I mean, like, we have my Atari right up there. You guys saw it the other yep. day, you know? I mean, like, we, I mean, like, you and me, we still play video games at least two to three times a, or more a week. Or together. more, yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, really great. Okay, let's go over some of these other stats. Okay. Because these are phenomenal. Uh, 63% of households have at least one gamer. Oh. That's 63% of all households. Now, that's that's at least one gamer. Yeah. Right. And and over half of the house is is this stat in America? Yeah. So this okay. is all for America. I think it's like the uh, it's like some international gaming association, but it's only f- based in American stats. Okay. All right. Well, is it is it America or North America? Oh, that's a good question. North America. Oh, North, North America. America. That's see, that's that's a big. That's a, yeah. It's even. Yeah. Warranty, this I is guess. this is a stat I found, uh, which was average daily minutes played per capita. Is twenty three minutes a day? 
Twenty three minutes a day. That's legit. You know what? I bet. I bet that takes a lot of like phone games into a consideration too. I wonder right. if it's a lot does. of fun. Maybe we should get one of our friends of the show from Big Fish Games on. Uh, oh yeah, that's I mean, not they ha- they have a market in uh, people who aren't normally gamers. Mm-hmm. These are the mobile games. Uh, it would be interesting to get their perspective on things. Cool. Right. Right. Maybe right. we'll reach out to them. Um, so here's the one here. that really messed with me a little bit because I remember not too long ago when I was like in high school where all you would see on like news and all that the <laughs> video games were really bad for everybody and people were playing too much Grand Theft Auto but now like 68% of parents think the video games have a positive impact and you know I think that has a lot to do with some human factor science that comes out I, I agree. think so too I agree I agree I'm and, gonna... I mean it helps with a lot of moral decisions and things like that and all that sort of jazz and you know it also gives people uh, thinking outside wonder, the box I wonder what the psychology behind Behind something like Telltale's games, where you have to make these ethical decisions. I mean, Mass Effect does that too, yeah. in a sense, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm going game. to read the uh, side note here that you have written on the notes, Blake. <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable. What? Unbelievable. It's That's nuts. Absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. No, right. Uh, and I mean, video games are huge, right? I mean, they, yeah. they grossed over 22 billion. In sales, uh, you know that. Funny enough, I know Price. maybe it's because I'm a fan. I even feel that that's a little low. It seems. I felt that way too. Yeah, it's, like yeah. I mean, like we've all like how much money have we sunk into like even our phone games? Well, let's like put this into perspective a little bit. So like yeah. big pharmaceutical companies made like a hundred and some odd billion. So I mean that's that's not even that big of a gap for video games to be making that much money. True. Right. It's just true, insane. True. They need to put video games in the classroom that way. They already are. I oh, mean, yeah. they're coming. But, yeah, but, I mean, like, we need to, the ABCs to be taught to us by Master Chief. Coding is being taught by <laughs> Minecraft. Really? Yes. Yeah. That's There is some cool. curriculum that introduces coding through redstone uh, building. I don't know what else to call it. It's like code. It is coding. Well, that's awesome. I mean, like, we all love these video games, and these are impressive stats. But before we drive into the specifics of what – video games makes video games great you know what is a good uh uh what are good elements in video game design do you think well one of them so we have friends of the show that work at riot and blizzard um and and one of their sort of pick up those names you just dropped (laughs) i'm not going to drop their names just in case they're not comfortable with their names being dropped on the show riot and blizzard i think is a good (laughs) enough name right there i will drop the companies i won't drop the specific (laughs) names um but uh, yeah, some of their core methods uh, are to see what other companies are doing, and it's it's a. I mean, this is no secret. All video game companies do this, uh, but I think the culture around it is a little bit different, right? Some cultures might be, um, you know, you can only play our games, uh, but a lot of them say, "Hey, look, go out there, play what is out there, see what works." Yeah bring that back home. See, I think that makes most sense because, I mean, that's even a, a human factors method, right? Do a competitive analysis of what products are out there yeah. for anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, even in the news, they're actually talking about that. Bethesda came out and said they're not going to give any more review copies out. They want the community to make a decision based on their games. And there's an argument for both sides of yeah. that. But, I mean, in general, the idea of it is, on on the surface, the idea of it is, I guess, is, uh, you know, it's about community. And video games are about community. You know, especially games like World of Warcraft or League of Legends or StarCraft Two or things like that. Right. Well, let me pose a question. I'm going to ask you guys. So we talked about how, you know, uh, other companies say go out, play these things. What to you guys makes a game good and what makes it bad? Which one gets it right? Which ones get it wrong? I just want to hear what you guys think. This is... Kind of unscripted. I have the question in here, so hopefully you saw that. But, uh, <laughs> well, no. Put us on the spot. You yeah, know, that bit. was the thing. I, w- I was thinking about this question, and I was like, well, what aspects do we talk about? Do we talk about art design? Do we talk about gameplay? Which ones just feel good? I mean, like, I guess any game that makes you I, – I, I always feel that it makes me care about the characters. Yeah, so, see, that was something I saw in a lot of because I read a bunch for this episode, uh-huh. and that was a big thing, like story and characters. But to be honest, for me, it's all about multiplayer. Multiplayer and every time. Like, so the sense of like the general community. Yeah, like how fun is it to play with your friends? What game modes they have? That kind of stuff. But I get the story portion of it for sure. Well, see, it makes a lot of sense. It's funny we have a really interesting gamut here because you are about the story, you're about the multiplayer aspect and sort of the social aspect of it, and I'm more of like if it doesn't have solid gameplay or like if if the interface is just bad i will sit there and have a fit and billy 
I have seen experienced this. this firsthand. Like, I just, I just, I'm not going to name the game because I don't want to call anybody out. But I just started this new game um, this past week, and and Billy has poor Billy has to sit there listening to me <laughs> fuss <laughs> and complain over over the uh, PlayStation chat about how bad this UI is. It's really but, bad UI. I do play it because of that social aspect. So there yeah. you go. See, that's the interesting part too, because like I really, from the start, got into Gears of War one, but the mechanics were awful, and they've changed so much and it's gotten so great. But like it was definitely that social component, just right. driving you through wanting to play yeah. with your buddies. You know what the thing about it is though is uh, yeah, Gears of War one, right, or two, or three. I played through all th- those games, and you know what it was? I'm telling you though. I cared about like Dom, and I cared about all those characters. You oh know? yeah, and I mean like get really in, absorbed in, in the universe. Three, right? you know, spoilers. You should have played the game by now. Uh, but, don't spoil it for don't spoil it for our. Oh, come don't, on, don't do it, don't do it. There might be some people who still haven't played through it. it it's been a long time, dude. No, you know no, I mean? no. Like, it breaks our spoiler policy. Sorry. <laughs> Burn. <laughs> all right. No, for me. A good one, uh, and I was talking with this about a colleague of mine a while back, uh-huh. um, and this was before I even played the game, but uh, he, he and I were talking about The Last of Us, and he said this is the most perfect interface. This is the fir- the perfect uh, sort of uh, way to interact with um, the items in your inventory. And I was like, okay, that's a pretty tall claim. And he described it to me, and I was like, mm, I don't know how I feel about that. And then I played it. And it was, it's pretty good. Did it really I, hold up? It does. So, so the way you, so you have like eight different weapons, uh, and and uh, the way you access them is by pressing a direction on the D pad, right? Uh-huh. And so, so there's four, and then if you press the D pad in that direction twice, you access the second gun. So, no gun is more than two clicks away. Um, so you can easily change to anything from anything, and it's uh. It's also good because you don't have to like cycle through guns like in those old games where you just continuously press the D-pad in just, one like, direction. Swapping the... through every gun. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was it was nice. You know, one of the other things about it is is that the uh, the, the the design can also play into uh, the ga- the the story and the style. Like for example, uh, Walking Dead season one by Tall Tale Games. Like one of the things something someone pointed out with me was is I don't understand why I have to move the directional pad around to hit a zombie in the head and hit the little dot on the head. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know why I had to do that. And someone sat down with me is because you're a history professor. You're a 40-year-old history professor who's afraid for his life. You're huh. not a zombie killing ubermensch. You're you're just this is this is not Zombie Land, right? You're not perfect. You're afraid. Now, now was that post hoc uh, rationale, or was that like something that they incorporated into their design? I think I don't. I I think it was por- incorporated into the design. Maybe post. It sounds like post hoc. It seems like it, but me. I mean, like I don't know. <laughs> like they don't do it with all their games. Maybe not though, because that sound like if you're a forty year old man who probably has not shot a gun too many times, probably not. I've never shot a zombie, and, and then a, a zombie lunges at you in the middle of it. And you only have like a bat. I don't know. Agree yeah, to disagree. What's next? Okay, so we talked about designing the user experience for of mobile apps on previous episodes. Yeah, I think that was what episode ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there anything different to take into account when designing for video games? So I thought this was really interesting going through a lot of this because I had I haven't had the pleasure of working at a video game company, so I had to use other people's kind of experience, <laughs> right? So what I f- what I kept seeing was, and I think this holds true, is you really have to shift your mindset because uh-huh. for so long I've been working like a product based sphere right where somebody gets something and it's to do some do some action right or in this case you're trying to design not really a product itself or how somebody's going to use it but you're trying to get somebody immersed in this story right. to really absorb this character's feelings and these t- situations they're being put in mm-hmm. so i think it's just a total shift in how you approach the problem mm, 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 mm. what do you think nick right well i mean yeah it's it's just a totally different sort of space than what you know normal products are right i mean you're designing instead of for utility you're designing for uh fun and that 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 in itself uh produces a a big challenge for developers to get around right and uh you know you also have this sort of perspective where you have to sort of um you have to 
connect with the user in a way that products don't normally. So like in, in the sense of like a story, right? We talked about story. That's important because now you not only have to design something that's fun, you have to design something that's going to connect with that person. What do you mean by? Give me an example. You said you cared about Dom. I did care about Dom. Why was that? Because they designed Dom to be a likable character. I see what you're saying there. Told a really intense story to pull at your heartstrings and all that kind of good stuff. Like, yeah. really get you emotionally invested in things. And that's I something see. I don't really think but about. But how does that come into play with the, the idea of the design? Really, that's big in the storytelling, right? Because they're trying to right. pull you in with this visual appealing set. But right. that's really not even enough just to keep you playing. Like, something can be really nice to look at, but if it's not intriguing, if it doesn't really get you emotionally invested in any way, you'll lose people. Yeah, you kind of have these three pillars that you have to hit. Story, uh, gameplay, uh -huh. and multiplayer, in a sense, too. Like, you got, or longevity, or replay value. Community. Yeah. So even, I, like, the let's talk about the emotional investment in, like, a in a multiplayer thing like you for me it's just the competitive nature of it like i'm really stoked on beating all my friends or being at the top of the food chain at the end of the game you've got to be the best competition yeah. challenge Cha it's yeah it's important to balance challenge with gameplay and we'll talk about that later i put a nice note in here okay um, so your focus shifts from trying to get someone to use a product as a means to an end but how does that affect uh what you and Nick do. Like, how does the design process come into what you guys do? Is some old, dark, witch stuff that you guys make? Yeah, so we get we get a coven. Oh, okay. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get a goat. And and we manifest a video game out of nothing. Is that how? Is there an app for that now? Like a little <laughs> pentagram that draws out? You put all your iPhones together? Shazam. No, let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about UI. Okay. Right. Um, so... It's interesting in video games how they can get away with a bad UI because if these other aspects shine, uh -huh. they can get a, it's kind of like a uh, it, it can sneak through. Like that game that I will not mention that we were playing this last week shines because it has a good community. Yeah, the community's solid. And because the story has hooked me. Really? The story has hooked you? Yeah. All right. But. The UI and the gameplay are terrible. The yeah, no, the, they are both terrible. I'm definitely asking what this game is out of this podcast. Oh, you know, we discussed uh, yeah, it we before the show. The, yeah. Oh, we did. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. It's the game that we're trying to get you to play. Yeah, we <laughs> oh. tried to get you to play it. Oh man, the community. I mean, but folks. here's the other thing: we play it together. But is that really a sense of community? I think so. I mean, I like, think... is it just? Are you thinking about just us? Or are you thinking about the whole thing? Because it's a thing. massive multiplayer game. The whole thing. Okay, okay. I think that uh, you're definitely a piece of it. And I think that, you know, even though, no, they didn't design with, oh, Nick and Billy are going to interact <laughs> in this game in mind, they definitely facilitated it okay. by making it an online multiplayer game in the first place. Right. By introducing these aspects that make uh, group things easier, e uh, more easily accessible. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's not like a design mechanic right there, right? You're trying to make missions more like co-op playable, that kind of good stuff. So that's the kind of things you would go out with design. You would lay out the kind of game that you're building. You would be like, what kind of aspects go into it? Is that what you're talking about with the idea of the design portion of it? See, that was really interesting for me, like, because re I read a lot about World of Warcraft and Destiny. That was the two big games yeah. that were laid out really hard. And what I read was basically that the most important part to get down and get right was the story. And like I talked about, really? like the multiplayer thing <laughs> but, for me, I was like, what? That doesn't make any but sense. Let's be honest. Destiny's story. Oh, it's it's well, bad. We, we won't go there. But it, it, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm sorry, but it's not great. No, I, mean, I mean, like there are highs and lows to it, but some of it's just like. I can't tell you what Wolves of the Door were actually about. I, yeah. But I guess the point was it was once you have all those kind of set pieces put together, you can really design the games you want to play, right? Okay. Yeah. So now you've got this, like, you know what the story is. Now you can get the details down into it and figure out how you're going to put mechanics together. So that's kind of like your guys' roadmap. Someone comes to you and says, I want to make uh, X survival game where it centers around it, these group of characters, and you're like, okay, this is the sort of stuff we need to put in to make it about that. What's the motto of the show? It depends. It depends. It depends. So so that's one aspect of it. That's one way to go through it. Another way to do it would be to say, hey, we have this engine with all these mechanics built in already. 
It's a uh-huh. first person shooter. What can we do with that? Let's reskin it, sell it again. Yeah, because that's like a big replay thing right there, right? You just take the mechanics that exist and put something else on it and right, but keep going. I mean, we we I think we've kind of tangented off this question. It was yeah. about UI. Yeah, UI. Right. So I guess what let's let's back it up and ask what makes a UI in a video game good or bad? Well, it's got to be functional. Well, it's got to work. Yeah, I, I can't sit there and hate it and criticize it. <laughs> Apparently you can't. <laughs> You're going to be playing this thing for the next 90 days. You already well, invested that. Yeah, but I mean, like, even some... Uh, okay, I have so many games that are just, like, terrible UIs, but I play them anyway. Such yeah. as? I'm really? not going to name names. I'm not, I'm not going to call out people like this. I just... <laughs> Uh, I just can't believe Bethes- it. Okay, look. Bethesda okay. and Blizzard are just sitting outside saying, we're waiting. Yeah, we're they're waiting. right outside the studio. <laughs> going, the yeah. door. No, I mean, <laughs> With baseball let, me, let me put it this way. On on uh, on some games, uh, the one that I mentioned that I had a really big problem with, it's like sort of a diamond in the rough is that you can rearrange the UI. Yeah. And oh, so awesome. if I spend time with it, I will rearrange the UI and get comfortable with it and it will be fine. I just have to spend the time. Right. It's not baked in, which is the annoying part. Something like Destiny, and I will call out Destiny, has a terrible UI. Why? What's wrong with Destiny's UI? Yeah, this should be interesting. <laughs> Why is Destiny bad? Because I actually I like, like the UI for you. Yeah, you like I, the UI? I, I, I do. Was, yeah. I mean, it's nothing well, spectacular, I mean, but I feel it's functional. Shooter, right? Okay. Yeah. Beyond the UI, it has a lot of usability issues. Oh, good. But, but. The usability issues, I will say, are driven by the technical requirements that were brought on by last generation's consoles, right? The PS3 and the Xbox 360. You couldn't introduce uh, an open world, so they had to introduce zoning, which is the whole orbital thing. Yeah, and that's right. that's just a load of bull. I'm sorry. That is just complete bull. Like, but, I it, mean, zoning it, is a thing that people use. Yeah. I mean, it's but, a viable option. Okay, okay. But zoning to a zone, to zone somewhere else, I'm sorry, that is just bad. Why don't you just take me to the other zone that I want to go to? Why can't I just zone from one zone to another and instead of having to Okay, I'm getting I'm getting really really worked up. You guys got to bring me back down. Let's talk about <laughs> Destiny's UI for a sec. Okay. Uh, I don't like it because it's like it's it's built with a keyboard and mouse in mind. Um, in the sense that when you go into the inventory system, you have to move the joystick, and it's a cursor that you move. Yeah, okay, so Wh- that is super gnarly. Why? Why don't you just hit yeah. the next thing on the – why don't you – when you hit right, why doesn't it just go to the next item in the list? And then instead huh. of having to drag this thing across and then drag it back – yeah, it's always weird when they try and migrate that like pointer system into either, it's like PS4 or Xbox. It drives me nuts. It's yeah. bad. Is Destiny on the PC? No. So they never even designed no. this thing oh, for wow. the PC. No. <laughs> so they just stuck it in there because they like. Uh, I'm getting cool. too worked up. All right, let, can we just talk about the next point? I'm getting okay, bad. so the next point on the thing was. Oh, um, usability, great. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, no, uh, focus on fully immersing each. Oh no, yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so a big part of it, I mean, you gotta you want it to be usable and functional, right? But it's gotta look great, or else. For me, I I honestly can't believe that you, Nick of all people, would still play something that doesn't look right because it drives me insane. I play Minecraft, games. sir. I know. What? what well, I I've mean, never like, played Minecraft though, so I don't know what it well, looks like. Well, there's a lot of games. Minecraft gets you on one of those three pillars, and it's still good. That one pillar is still good enough. And is that just like functional? That's that's yeah yeah that's functionality awesome. yeah. Well, I mean, like, I've played a lot of games that have bad, like, you know, like that whole uh, 8-bit resurgence, you know, that everybody's running around with and everything like that. That, like, retro I mean, revive, yeah. yeah. But look, I mean, you, can, cool you can make 8-bit. Undertale. You can make 8-bit look good. Yeah, but I mean, like, games like Undertale don't look like they're necessarily on your high idea of functionality or usability type of scale. Like, I'm not it's familiar just, with Undertale. I'm not either. If you, you got it, me you there. love it. I'm just saying. Under the tail? Undertale? Oh, man, you guys play Undertale. We're going to have comments about this. Oh, great. I'm telling you, it's going to be a thing. Uh, but, I mean, like, that game is very blocky. Uh, it's very, like, dot DOS level, like, games type of thing with a amazing story and interesting cast, but it's not elaborately designed. 
That's pretty cool. See, that again goes back to that story element of it just being something that pulls you in. Then we could just stop the podcast here and say that I, I win. The only point about video game design you need to know is story. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, guys. Well, Billy wins this week. We'll see you next time. I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. No, no, no. no. Okay, no, so no. what's the last point here? So one part that I that kept coming up was, like, as a – and maybe, Nick, this is something you and I can bang back and forth. Is sure. When you run into, a, like, a, a human factors or a – family you, show. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But you run into problems where you want to remove any kind of issues people are having. And a lot of this, a lot of this is, like, friction. People are running against problems using the UI, or you need to f- make sure that they can quickly get through their – normal like efficient process but in video right. games it's a little bit different it's almost it as is. if you want to introduce that for yeah it's almost like uh onboarding with any other app you know or or uh no, what's the... i'm sorry can you break that down for me i'm sorry guys yeah no, i'm sure. lost on that so oh. well what what part of it like what he just said like explain <laughs> that to me again i'm sorry <laughs> okay so typically like Let's say I have just a general application, right? Uh huh. So I want my user set to be able to quickly get through the task they need to do. Say they want to add items to a list. You want okay. to make that like two steps. Right. But in a video game, if I just took out all the hard parts, what fun would the game be? Right. You want to build in challenge. Oh, I see. Like, don't press one button to win. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what video games are for, is to, like, challenge you to, you don't, yeah, you don't want to win, but then you don't want it to be too difficult either, or else you're not having fun. And so it's about this this balance between, uh, you know, difficulty and sort of uh, player skill. Like, you, you, we talked about designing for the the core of your audience in one of our episodes, I think it was the design episode, right? Uh-huh. Um, and you want to definitely do that here, because... If you design for the really skilled players, right, you're going to alienate or block off uh, a ton of sales, right, right, right. Or if you make it too easy, people will be like, "Yeah, it's an easy game. Get it for the trophies." Yeah, I beat it in uh, like four hours. So yeah, I'm good to go. So you want some kind of combination of the two, right? You want to okay. bring in the new people, but you don't want to alienate your hardcore gamers because you know that that's pretty much who's grown right. your brand over the years. And How then, do you explain Dark Souls then? Well, that, that that one I've never played. Well, look. So Dark Souls' thing is that it's it's a difficult game. It's very hard. It's its whole platform is this is a tough game. It will take you back to the good old days when it was you know Super Nintendo Battle Toads. Yeah, Battle Toads status. Oh like, my. Yeah. I mean, the thing with Dark Souls is that that's that's what they made that's what they made it on. So and, the idea of it is is that if it's the goal that you're making, then you do it. Right. Yeah, because remember, you're going to define your target audience no matter what product you make. Right. Especially in video games. If it's for everybody you're trying to reach all, like, walks of video game players, dope. But if it's, like, Dark Souls, like what you're saying, that it's supposed to be super hard, like, for the people that really want a tough challenge, then that makes sense. Like, but they... the UI is solid in Dark Souls, so it makes up for it. It's kind of like, kind of like a balance <laughs> thing, right? I don't know, man. Do you have the skill to play Dark Souls? I, I personally don't have the skill. But so I, does the UI do make I... up for it? Well, I mean, the, are you going to play it just for the UI? <laughs> well, no, but I mean, the idea of it is, is I could get good at Dark Souls if I practiced at it. Yeah, you know, you, you know what I'm saying? Though yeah. that's always the argument people use at Dark Souls. You can get good at it. I've got to try this game if it's that hard. It's there's a whole series of them. Um, I'm sure one of us could let you borrow some. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yeah. So let's let, we're talking about usability here. Um, I'm going to read the notes. Just we sidetracked so much. <laughs> this is a tough one this, to talk about. Well, no, it's not tough. It's super easy, and that's why we're getting sidetracked. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. So uh, we talk about the learning curve in our notes here, and I just want to I want to revisit that because I want to talk a little bit about tutorials because a lot of uh, design goes into tutorials, and what's the first thing you do when you get into a game? You skip, skip the tutorial. Right. Uh, and, I always regret that later, though. Right, yeah. yeah, I, yeah, mean, yeah. I mean, the... The best games do a tutorial by introducing you skills in the game. While it's going, like the Batman game. Yeah. You you want to sort of rely on these uh, sort of conventions and standards to give the player enough to go off of. Like, let's say it's a shooter. Right. right with some unique aspects of it. You give them, um, and this is one thing that I will give Destiny an okay pass on, uh, is that it introduces you to the skills at an acceptable rate. So... 
One, you'll start off with just a gun. Uh-huh. And then you level up and you get grenades or I forget what's next. You get grenades or something. And they're like, okay, so you're familiar with shooters. Um, you're shooting things. All right, you trigger, move, yeah, and look. Okay. You know, that actually really is done well in Destiny. Uh, yeah. I I remember it. Yeah. yeah. And then and then the next level you level up and you get, uh, what is it, uh, melee. You get a yeah. melee attack. And you don't, like, melee is standard in most games up front. But they introduce you to these slowly, so that way you can, you know, press the button and get exactly what you want. But you're still progressing. You're still figuring things out. And then it gives you your super ability, which is, you know, both both uh, bumpers. Yeah. So, I mean, it ramps you up slowly to all these abilities. And then it introduces you to, okay, you can do different things with these. But we're not going to give them all to you at the same time. You'll unlock them slowly over time. So I think that is one thing that it does well. And I think that's a model that more games should follow is that don't give me a tutorial that I'm just going to skip. Don't explain everything up front. Explain it as it comes through. And that's something that developers have to consider when they're going through and making their games. I mean, where that never happens is in multiplayer. You rarely ever see, like, a tutorial that comes all the way through the game. The only one I've seen recently is, of course, what you're talking about with Destiny a little bit. But they've done it in Gears 4, too. Like, they've changed some of the movement mechanics, and they throw it in there as you play different like uh, multiplayer matches. Well, like, for example, like uh, World of Warcraft, since we mentioned it earlier... It kind of gets you in there by keeping the story going and things like that. And you use and learn the moves you're supposed to do by doing story, which is important, I think. Yeah, and it's World of Warcraft is really good because it only gives you what you need or what you have access to at the time. It doesn't really throw a whole lot of stuff on your UI until it's necessary. Mm-hmm. Or until you get a bunch of mods and start doing raids. So, usability. We've talked about how does that work in video game context. We just talked about usability. I mean, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> Level design. <laughs> well, like we said, it's like we're all over the place with this one. So yeah, you know, sorry. We, we're, we're skipping around and I'm, 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 I'm professional. This is our professional work <clears throat> right now. Come let's, on, okay, let's talk about level design. What is level design and how do you ensure that each level will provide challenging experience for the player. I mean, we talked about tutorials, which is pretty much level zero. Right. So once you've... uh, I I read this great article, and I'm going to go ahead and plug these guys, because this was was a fantastic article on Um, JuicyBeast.com. And it gives an awesome overview about how to design a platforming level. And I'm going to talk about this in the platforming sense, but you can extrapolate this to any game. Uh, and, and you can just imagine how complex this will get once you go from 2D to 3D and then incorporate a ton of different ways to accomplish a goal. But check this out. Real so, quick before you get too far. Yeah. Platforming. Platforming is just like jumping from Mario one platform. Brothers. Mario is a good gotcha. example. Cool. Um, it's Think about like a 2D side scroller that you are literally jumping on platforms to get to the goal. Cool. Okay. Think about it from this perspective. So we talked about balance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we talked about balance, especially in our board game design episode. Yeah, That was a great episode. If you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to that. Um, but yeah, with balance, you don't want to give anybody an unfair advantage, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so so this is, this is in the sense of multiplayer. You don't want to give anybody an unfair advantage. But you also don't want to um, – you also want to balance skill with uh, challenge like we – discussed earlier you don't want to make it too hard you don't want to make it too easy it's a it's a game right um so so one tip they give for um designing a platformer is to make your level right so 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 you literally draw this out you don't don't code anything yet draw this out it's just like a Uh mock-up you draw this thing out and then you just draw desire paths for your little avatar right so like if you're if your goal is up a series of jumps you um you sort of draw the desire path the path of least resistance to that way and then like let's say you uh you take into consideration some of the mechanics of the game so like how high does the character jump um how far can they jump is this platform too small to land on is it these are all things that you have to consider um and so uh you draw a desire paths to the goal uh-huh um you have to understand which game mechanics you have so like is there a double jump? Like I said, how how tall, how high do you jump? How far can you jump? How wide is the platform? How can these things be used to get to the goal? And are there different paths to it? Um, and then they talk about. Uh, I mean, we're just we're talking about this at the most basic level. Like I said, this is a two D platformer. 
with very, very limited sort of uh, ways to get to a goal. So in this argument that you're saying, and it just popped in my head, yeah. the perfect first level probably, I mean, that everyone would know is Super Mario Brothers World 1-1. Is that perfect though? I mean, you. I mean, think about it. You start the game all the way at the left hand side of the screen. Right. So you can't go anywhere on the left hand side of the screen. You can only go forward. Right. And you're always in. And after that, you're always in the middle of the screen. Right. And you when can you, never go back. Right. And then when you get to the front of it, you have plenty of. You, the first thing you see is actually the question mark. Right, so you can experience the question mark as the little Goomba is coming up to you. You have plenty of time as that Goomba is coming up to you to jump and see what's going on to figure out which button is jump. And then the platform, it doesn't give you a tutorial. No, and that platform is actually, and I found this out, is actually the top height that you can actually jump to without running. Mm. So if you hit A, yeah. as you jump up as high as you can, you will land on that platform every time because it is the perfect height for that jump. That's a great point. That's pretty sweet, man. Yeah. And yeah, and they they designed it so that way if you jump up underneath it, you would hit the question mark. And then what do you get? You get a mushroom. That mushroom tells you that's the way to actually do it. Yeah. So I mean, we're talking about this just in the two D sense, but you can imagine, like I said earlier, how this could get more complex if you have a three D platformer. Mm -hmm. Then you have to design for three dimensions. You have to make all these different paths. So you can imagine you can't account for everything, and that's why video game design is so hard. Mm -hmm. And then when you start adding in abilities like sliding and um, triple jumping and some classes can do this and some classes can't do this, you know, like it's it gets very, very complex very quickly. But how awesome would it be able to see these workflows like laid out? Because all this is is a really, I mean, this this probably came before, but like for, this is just like website design, really. Like right. Like defining an optimal path. Yeah. How many ways can you get there? Yeah, exactly. It, I don't know. It's That's very analogous awesome. to that. And I think it's really cool because user testing is done the same way. Wow. They did that in a way that I hadn't anticipated at all. Is that? Let's patch that. Yep. Is that kind of <laughs> like... Is that kind of like how Gears... I mean, in that argument, almost Gears of War is almost like a platformer, if you think about it. Uh, can you jump in Gears of War? No, 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 no. Think about it. What is the main objective of defense that you have in Gears of War? Smashing your body against barriers. Right? Getting behind chest-high walls. And finding the best route of moving up the battlefield, yeah, jumping from chest-high wall to chest-high wall. And if you jump to the wrong chest-high wall, you're going to get lit up with gunfire. Oh, yeah. Like That's if you bounce point. the wrong way, you're in trouble. Oh, dude. Yeah. Gears of War is secretly a platformer. No. <laughs> so um, you basically use this to ramp new players into this as well. But how do you help new players getting on board with this game? So one way you can always like strike a chord with new players is just like using something that's continually used in different games. So first person shooters, you know, left trigger, aim, right trigger, shoot. Right. Like that yeah. kind of easy stuff. Uh, but one mistake that I've seen a couple of different, uh, I'll just use Call of Duty as an example here, but a couple of different developers do is they add little mechanics but don't ever tell anybody about them. Kind of like sliding in Black Ops that disappears in Modern Warfare. So that can actually oh, lose your players in some some cases. Too. Right. Yeah. I was used to this mechanic and now it's gone. Or, uh, you know, like, why am I getting beaten so quickly because these other people are utilizing this? Yeah, it it's goes back kind of a little bit about the tutorial you were talking about. Right. Like, if you're like me and you get something on night one, you jump into multiplayer and you don't know what's been added, what's been taken away. And there has to be, like, certain senses of universal truth, too, like... Like in all shooters, the trigger button is always fire. Yeah. Like uh, what you said with um, consistency and standards. Consistency and standards. Mm -hmm. And the same thing was said in No Man's Skies. You, uh, the inventory, what was it? The inventory button or the. Oh, reload they button? use that same BS system that Destiny does with the. The point and click? The point and click. Oh, oh it's so yeah. Stupid. No, I mean, like, didn't you say, like, there, why is the run button. The run button was R3 instead of L3. Right. It's always L. And he was like, that's so confusing because it's we're dumb. used to it because it's consistency and standards. I'm learning. Yes. <laughs> so. Oh, I wanted to make another point, too. Battlefront did this, too, with a roll ability. So in the base game, there was no roll ability. Uh, and then they added this later and didn't tell players. Uh, and so, you know, one day I was playing, and I see these people dodging around, and I'm like, how? How are you, <laughs> how are you doing this? It was in the patch <laughs> notes. <laughs> and they, they're pretty bad. Like, I love Battlefront, but they're pretty bad about, like, letting people know about new star cards. and whatnot. Right, right, right. Like, unless you're part of the app. 
uh, they'll like push notifications to you, like new store cards available. Um, but yeah, so See, we're that's ta- something I didn't know anything about was these like supplemental apps that you can have for games. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they're they're big. That blew me away. I'm waiting for one to actually feed my mount in that game we're not talking about. <laughs> oh yes. Okay, uh, so we're talking a lot about the importance of user interface in game design, but can you guys give an example? Of why it's so important, because we talked about the idea that a story can actually overcome a lot of these Hold things. Hold up. One sec. I got to apologize for anyone listening. We're recording this on Halloween, so there are plenty of children outside yelling and screaming, if you hear that. <laughs> uh, we are not in a torture chamber. <laughs> we are in a garage. Quiet, children. <laughs> uh, okay, what was the question? I'm sorry. So, we talked about, like, I, I said earlier that, you know, it seems like story is the most important thing to design and everything like that, but... You know, we're talking a lot about the importance of user interface in games design. What can you guys give me as an example of why it's so important? So I'm going to throw this one back out to Luke because he asked that question about, like, hey, can you guys talk about WoW a little bit? Thanks, Luke. Thank you, Luke. And since since uh, Nick plugged the website, he got the got one of the articles from. I'm going to do the same for these guys. This is from Digital Telepathy. And uh-huh. They did a big breakdown of, like, Blizzard and... Uh, wow especially but so i don't know if you guys remember i'm sure you do but wow it used to be like a a real-time strategy game yeah and then of course and then it more warcraft did yeah warcraft Warcraft did you're right yeah 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 orcs versus humans and then here comes the greatest mmorpg of all time or one of the most well known for sure debatable whether or not it's the best but second life right we're talking about yes that one (laughs) it's my favorite uh, yeah, but I I'm mean, I'm a level is... 32 unicorn in second. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what people are always looking for in the UX business is unicorns. Uh, unicorns. Of course. Consistency of design of unicorns. <laughs> so, okay. Back all right, to let's it. get back on it. So, here for like, wow, you have this big shift and a focus to a single character now. You're not just monitoring a bunch of different little goons, you're, you're using one character going through their story, right. getting new abilities. Right. Um, and then this was good for like new players too, because I remember the first time I played WoW, I had no idea what was going on. Never played really too many PC games, but they only like included things in the UI that you absolutely needed. Right. And then it was re- it was super customizable, so you could like throw different combinations together and all that kind of you stuff. You can assign different hotkeys. You can assign different hot bars. Yeah, that was always interesting. And then, yeah, but they never teach you that stuff in the tutorial that I'm aware of. I definitely got it from one of the tutorials because I wouldn't have known. Yeah, but it would help. But it's not. It's. I don't think it's anything like. Like the old wizard doesn't come out of the tutorial and say, "If you push up and down arrow, you will be able to see other hot bars." <laughs> <laughs> when you fight the demon. Well, I mean, true. And once you get more complex, I mean, this is kind of where WoW did a great job, right? Like they have all these extra mods that you can put on for raids when you're if you're like a really intensive player. You're right. playing like groups and things like that. So I I don't know I mean it's a it's a crazy and beautiful world that they created through their UI. So the yeah. idea of it is is that they 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 made an intuitive UI, and then what they did was they listened to their community and 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 perfected their UI, kind of like you know put a little bit of more flavor into it based on what they wanted. Yeah, I mean they had a lot of customization options you could go for if you were going outside or if you were just a new player you could stick with the the same old easy stuff. I get it, I get it, I get it. Okay, okay. So what else, I mean like when you're going through this sort of stuff, when you're going through the UI design, do you look at the, I, I mean like how do you not make it the way you want it to be and how you make it for the player? I think we talked about it a little bit before. You know what I'm saying? Oh, a little bit of tune. Yeah. yeah. Someone's outside blasting <laughs> something. Happy Halloween, everyone. No, I mean, but, like, we talked about it before, but it's the idea of, like, um, um, you know, like, I designed a computer game, okay. and I know all the secrets and tricks to it because yes. it made sense to me. Right. You how know- do you make it make sense to other players? Play testing. <laughs> yeah, that would be That's the a- easiest way. Either that, following conventions, like whatever's already existing, right. kind of using stuff you can leverage, but then play testing the heck out of it. Oh, but yeah. Is that also why people, like a lot of like ga- major game companies are collecting user data now? I Ooh, would assume yeah. so, yeah. I mean, that's really feeding all the changes they make and helps them get their oh, patches yeah. together. That kind If of they stuff. find a lot of people are getting stuck on Quest X, uh-huh. they'll change Quest X. Okay, okay. So... <clears throat> Um, so granted video games look 
awesome, especially nowadays. And uh, with the introduction of VR, you know, because we did that PSVR impression last, last week. week. Yeah, that was good. But uh, how do you – I mean, like, we talked a little bit about the idea of user interface keeping fresh with the community. But how else do you design to keep your game going for three, four, five years? Like uh, Grand Theft Auto Five. Trick them into paying for a subscription – and <laughs> <laughs> and then there's three stuck. months at a time. <laughs> no, they they are, uh, and by they I mean game developers mm-hmm. are using psychology. They oh. are they are hacking us. As... I I've heard of this thing. I think what, I know what this is this one. thing. The Skinner box situation. Uh, c- yeah, kind of. Press They're lever enough def- times. Def- yeah. def- definitely <laughs> using Skinner box uh, theory. Is that not what it, for, what no, we mean? That's part of it. Certainly. I mean, there's I mean, some like, we're gonna going to hack the on. brains with your witchcraft and wizardry. Blake, you put this in there. How yeah, do you so pronounce the, this? Oh, man, this is going to be tough, and I already feel bad, but he's long gone. I think it's Zygernik. Zygernik? What is he? Zygernik. Zygernik? Russian? So, uh, I think he was a German scientist that, like, in the 20s discovered that when people leave tasks incomplete or interrupted, they're better remembered. Hey, guys, can I just interrupt us really quick to talk about the... Oh, you know what? Oh. Right. Go ahead, Blake. Yeah, Nick interrupted me that one time. I'll never forget it now. <laughs> but yeah, so when you know that something's incomplete, you get this feeling like, okay, I want to go do that because right. you're, you just remember it. And all the games that well, I, I know that I like um, definitely use this, but one that I had read about was Destiny. And if you think about it, all those meters and all the different things that you have to go and accomplish on like a right. regular basis, right? Uh, just keep the daily pulling quest. you back. Yeah, the daily quest, even stuff like wow, like the daily quest for me They're on Friday. For me, it's stupid trophies and achievements. It's so stupid, but I feel like I I am compelled when I have something sitting in my log and people can see it on my profile, even though no one looks at it. It's like I know it's incomplete, and it bothers me that it's not complete i want to go back and finish all the trophies that i can to get 100 percent so i can see it they're playing isn't, your sensibilities man yeah isn't, isn't that like having a picasso in a private bathroom yes that's exactly like having a picasso in a private bathroom billy yeah how how did you get to that conclusion? well i mean like it's like a, have, it's like a look at this really beautiful thing that i admit, that i have and look how great it is and how hard it was to get, but no one ever goes into that bathroom because it's no, just for me. It's it's more about the completion aspect of it for me. It's okay. like I, I know I have these things that are incomplete, but I need to finish them. I don't have enough time to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Got to do it somehow. Uh, let's talk about leveling up because that that's the same thing. When you see things, when you see progression, you're addicted to that progression. They're hacking your psychology to make you – want to play more. See, and this is secretly why I don't have a PS4 yet, because you guys will be so <laughs> many levels above me, it's going to drive me insane. No, man. We'll Actually, funny we'll enough, the out. game that we're not talking about, we can always get down to your level and help you get up there. Uh-oh. Yeah. 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 Um, it, it really plays off that social aspect that we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, no, and it keeps you playing, too, because it's like I was stuck as one class doing one thing but i can seamlessly switch from class to class to class i feel like we've given enough clues as to what this game is and our listeners will figure it out oh probably anyway. and i i think why are you hating on this game I, we're not play hate it. we play it we yeah. we paid for let's it. be clear nick has a problem with the ui but he can fix that All yeah right. yeah that's simple okay so like uh so video games are using psychology to keep players playing so that's what we're talking about the idea of that skinner box and things like that but um you know like what kind of little things do they do to do it? I mean, just the idea of leveling up and getting completions is there, but, you know, those things are finite things. You can finish those. Well, like kind of we talked about earlier, you know, how you take the you just take the mechanics that exist and you put a new face on it. Like, there's right. there's business behind all oh, yeah. this kind of stuff. Yeah, they, they, they plan for the long term. Uh, when they push out a game, some of these companies, they're already – planning like okay this is going to burn out in a couple months here and we're gonna have to push something else out Uh uh-huh and create excitement around it get people back in get the player base back so i mean that i mean like and then you know you have like vanity items you have new dungeons raids quests things they add new content that's cheap to produce that will keep people coming back is it really cheap like halloween events that's just a couple assets. Isn't that more of like a – is that a human factors thing? Like you guys say, okay, when Christmas rolls around, they're going to get secret Christmas presents, and then these things are going to pop out and give them present stuff. I mean, it definitely plays off psychology. Uh-huh. The psychology of like – if there's a um, 
God, I wish I wrote this in the notes. There's a thing where if I give you something, uh-huh. the the concept of reciprocity, we talked about this before. If I give you something, yeah. you're more likely to give me something back. If I give you an in-game item or an in-game event, right. you're more likely to give me your playtime. But do you guys actually, like, kind of, like if you guys were working on a video game, would you be the guys who were designing that, or would that be another job? It would probably be, like, an interplay between whatever, like, I guess the developers and the creative team come up with, and then looking yeah. at the d- the levels and all that kind of stuff, seeing where they present issues. So right. they would give you an outline, and you would fill in the adjectives. Now, this is kind Maybe. of, like, a guess, because remember, I haven't worked right. in any kind of development From, from what I understand, this is not necessarily the role, uh, predominantly, of a... Uh, UX or human factors person on, on staff. This is more like the marketing perspective oh. um, because they can get at this a lot more, but there's a lot of psychology that goes into marketing. So we can kind of talk at that aspect too. Maybe but, another different episode? Uh, psychology of marketing. That'd yeah. be dope. Yeah, that yeah. Be cool. yeah, digital Definitely. marketing too. Yeah. Well, what's this hooked model that you have in Destiny here? What is that? Yeah, so this was... Uh, and this is based off of a book that I think is called Hooked, but it's really just a habit-forming process. And uh, the guys that are from Digital Telepathy wrote this down like as it applied to Destiny. So it's really having a bunch of triggers that are outside of the person that's playing the game that force, or not force them, but get them a little more excited to play. Like if you're, let's say, like internal ones, like you're bored, so you want to go play a game or you want to go hang out with your friends online, that kind of stuff. And then there's also like the external trigger. So this is where I picked up the thing about the apps that they have for fu- that push notifications about right, like right, oh right. this new patch is out that kind of stuff. Right. And then so these like triggers are followed up by whatever action that there is in the game. So in Destiny it's pretty simple. You just go shoot all the things. All the mans. All the mans. Um, and then by shooting all the things, you get these different layers of rewards. So whether it's loot, leveling up, getting more debt. Da- Getting more bounties finished, that kind looking of stuff. Looking pretty. Yeah. Looking pretty is a thing. And so this just, again, turns on to more investment of users' time, right? So as they experience these, experience these triggers and get these rewards, they want to invest more time in the game, usually. I, I just also want to throw out to everyone in the audience, though, we're dropping a lot of, like, uh, sites and things like that. When we get closer to actually dropping the episode on the podcast, we'll definitely be putting all these links in there so you can do your own research as well and continue the conversation. So with all that said... I want to I want to end today. Okay. With a philosophical question. Uh-oh. Ooh. Brought to you by the Game Design subreddit. Game okay. Design subreddit. Yeah, let's I, this is a question I saw on there and I was like, "Oh, this is really really interesting." Uh-huh. Um, so after everything that we talked about today. Right. Is it better to have an easy game with options to become harder or more difficult or a difficult game with more options to become easier? So would you rather the Dark Souls approach where it starts off really hard, but you have an option to come down or an easy game where you can ramp up the difficulty? I have my answer, but I want to hear what you guys think. Well, I mean, like, I want to ask one of the things that I always want to bring up is, is that the, 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 the game cheats sometimes. The game cheats. Like if you put it on a difficult setting, the game will cheat. Like, I mean, it's really big in <laughs> RTSs and uh, strategy games, but it'll be like, and there were four guys right here. Why? How? Where did they come from? I mean, like, even like XCOM, when uh, the actual creator of XCOM came out and said, no, 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 our hard, hard mode is not fair. It will cheat. So, so you're saying that it, it, it uh, sort of gets outside of these normal... Um, Bonds. The, the normal ways in which users interact with the game in order to produce a harder difficulty. Right. I mean, in that sense, I would rather have a easy game that I can ramp up on so I can have a mastery of it, you know, before I actually get to the point of it cheating on me. But I mean, like, I mean, I've played other games like that. And, and I'm not saying cheating in a bad way. It's just like, you're good. We're going to make it a little unfair so you can be better. You know what I mean? It's not impossible to do. It's just really hard to do yeah i mean i i totally get the wind to ramp up stuff and i mean it makes sense especially because nick like you were talking about i get ocd about getting collectibles too <laughs> but i don't know i always hop into either like getting in legendary mode or insane mode and gears that's the first so, thing so I go you into. jump in like hard all as the I way get, yeah because so, at some point it'll knock me down so hard that i'll have to turn it down or i'll go play multiplayer and those guys aren't as good as some of the ai bots in like insane right so, so i don't know it, i never even thought about it that it way. has a good like for gears it's really good because you have to do headshots in insane 
and then your multiplayer skills are dope. Well, that makes a lot of sense because I'm really bad at Destiny's multiplayer when I'm playing with like Nick here or other guys online that we have because they're really high tier. And I play with them all the time because I like the idea of community and everything. So I'll play with them all the time, do horribly, like really bad, right? Yeah. yeah. And then I will go and I will play just a game by myself with my horrible losing streak and multiple deaths. And I'll be like, what is everybody doing as I just gun them all down? And I'm like, oh, my God, this is what progression feels like. <laughs> it's because it pairs you with higher tier difficulty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's we're in a team and it pairs with the higher difficulty. That's what I'm saying. It starts out easy. You get the mastery because they started out easy and got the mastery. I started out with them, so I didn't get an easy mode. I just had you to just had to adjust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so what do you think? Well, for me, it's interesting because I usually start somewhere in the middle. I start like normal mode, and then if it's too easy, I'll ramp it up. Or if I know there's a trophy that <laughs> involves like the hardest difficulty, I'll just play that way. So that way, I don't have to go through it again. Solo crota. But but um, yeah, it's the one trophy. I still need yeah. well, not solo, but it, without, Do it dying. without dying. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, but I'm thinking about this from like a um, from like a puzzle perspective. So think about games that uh, that have these really difficult puzzles, right? With the internet being as ubiquitous as it is, people will find out the solution to a puzzle and share it. And if you get stuck, it's not like you know, the Nintendo days where you can, where like, you had to dial the 1-800 you, number. Well, either that, or you had to get the cheat codes or, yeah. or you, you spent months and months and months on this one game because that's all you get and right. until another game comes out and you have the time to invest into that game to figure out the things. No one was, I mean, the only way you shared any information was through word of mouth. It was really difficult to find out these answers, but now you can just search it on the internet. So when it comes to that, I'm a big fan of introducing really difficult uh, sort of – it's got to be a good mix. But really difficult puzzles intrigue me because, you know, if you make it so impossible that people won't figure it out – I'm talking about, like, for raids, right? Like on oh, Destiny, yeah. Right. If, you, if you make this, like, one mechanic, like, you got to press this button on the wall. And then you got to go do a circle around the boss three times, and then like who's do gonna the hokey pokey? Who's backslash gonna figure dance. that out? Some wild that's, stuff. Yeah. That's cool to me. That's cool. You because think that's good because I think I think that introduces this whole community. But in terms of single player games, um, I think somewhere right in the middle. I think I don't think I think you want to design for that majority, and the majority is going to start right in the middle. Well, I mean, he does have a point. He's not alone in this thought. I mean, like for example, a lot of people do the whole new. Uh, wow raids and they're disappointed when the boss goes down yep quickly yep. everyone's like I would be too yeah I can't believe they beat it already world they first they were like oh like two hours shame. after yeah yeah that's a bummer and, yeah, and, yeah yeah yeah. that's what I'm talking about is like dude that stuff is it. such a struggle yeah like, I can't, yeah, don't, I don't know. stand in the fire and get better at your DPS yep. yeah that's it <laughs> alright guys we done yeah we're done alright All right. that's gotta be it for today if you wanna be featured on our show like Luke uh, we're all over social media. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud, Facebook, or Twitter. Or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com with all your questions, comments, whatever. If you like what we're doing, you can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and review us five stars on iTunes, the Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast directory. We're always trying to keep in touch with interesting topics that our listeners want to hear about on the show. So feel free to use the force and suggest a way like Luke did. <laughs> <laughs> I saw what you did there. Uh, Blake Arnsdorf, where can our listeners find you? Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter at UX Chilbro. Billy Hall, where can they find you? You can find me on YouTube or Twitter at Comstar Cleric. All right. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It's a bitch!